Uh, James Perloff is a freelance writer based in Boston, Massachusetts. For many years, he has been a contributor to the New American Magazine. His first book, Shadows in a, of Power, an expose of private influence on American foreign policy, has sold over 100,000 copies. His most recent books, Tornado in a Junkyard and The Case Against Darwin, are layman's level discussions of the growing scientific case against Darwin's theory of evolution. Mr. Perloff has been a guest on well over 100 radio and television programs to discuss both history and the creation evolution debate. He's noted in Who's Who in America. He is also a, a composer of the music CD, Freedom Shall Return. Jim will be happy to sign any copy of his books after the speech. I also want to say I've been a member of the Birch Society for eight years. I've been on staff six. I've worked with Jim many times. He's a, he's a wonderful speaker, a great gentleman, and a true friend. Thank you. Thank you. See, uh, I don't know if we want to experiment with turning off the front lights, Kip, or not. Uh, I guess we have a pretty clear image with the light of the uh, lights on. Okay. Well, we'll be talking. Uh, it's even better, though. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, American history tonight in a way that uh, <coughs> some of you may never have heard it told before. Just ask that you listen with an open mind. I'm going to start with um, one of the most tragic events in American history: Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Uh, 18 U.S. warships, including eight battleships, were sunk or heavily damaged. About 2,000 Americans were killed, many more wounded, about 200 planes destroyed on the ground. And uh, what question do you think Americans were asking the day after Pearl Harbor? Besides what happens now, what do you think people were asking? Where is Pearl Harbor? <laughs> well, now they're probably asking that in our school system. But um, uh, they were asking, you know, how did this happen? How come America got caught off guard like this? How could this disaster have taken place? Well, President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, appointed a commission to um, answer that question. It's called the Roberts Commission. And the Roberts Commission might be called a Washington-friendly group. Uh, the mayor ran it. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Owen Roberts was quite friendly with the president. Retired Admiral Joseph Rees had been given a job in lend -lease by the president. Uh, General McNarney was uh, on the staff of uh, Army Chief of Staff George Marshall and uh, selected <laughs> on his recommendation. Um, General McCoy was a, a personal friend of Army Chief of Staff Marshall. It was a very Washington-friendly group. Well, they held three weeks of hearings. They had uh, a couple days they spent in Washington, then 19 days in Hawaii. And at the end, they issued an official report, and they said that Washington had uh, done its job in an exemplary manner before Pearl Harbor. They said all the blame lay with our military commanders in Hawaii, namely Admiral Husband Kimmel, the Pacific Fleet Commander, and General Walter C. Short, the Army Commander. They said they uh, failed to take adequate surveillance of the waters surrounding the islands, and they accused them of dereliction of duty. And the words dereliction of duty appeared on newspaper headlines across America. These two guys were crunched. I mean, they got inundated with hate mail and death threats. Even members of Congress stood up and said these two men should be shot because they were responsible for the deaths of thousands of young Americans. Now, Kevin Short protested the findings of the Roberts Commission. They pointed out that Justice Roberts had taken unsworn testimony until they corrected that. Uh, they, he'd refused them the right to have uh, fellow officers serve as their attorneys. He said, this is not a trial, so you don't have, have to have an attorney. And they found that significant testimony was left out of the report. So these two guys did something almost no military man ever asked they, to be done. They asked to be court-martialed because they wanted the issue of Pearl Harbor to be resolved in a real courtroom using standardized rules of evidence, not uh, Owen Roberts' personal rules. But President Roosevelt said no. He said, look, I've already relieved these men of their duties. We're at war now. There's more important things. No court, courts martial. Uh, no, no, that, that won't do any good. But Kimmel and Short kept pressing their case, and so did Congress. They wanted these trials, too. Finally, in 1944, Congress mandated that the courts martials occur. And in that year, the Naval Court of Inquiry and the Army Pearl Harbor Board convened. Now, at these two trials, the attorneys for Kimmel and Short presented undeniable evidence that Washington had complete foreknowledge of the Pearl Harbor attack, but withheld it from our military commanders. Now, as the um, admirals on the Naval Court of Inquiry heard the evidence being read, they threw their pencils on the floor in disgust. 
and uh, Admiral Kimmel was completely exonerated. They laid all blame on Washington. They couldn't name Roosevelt because it was beyond their jurisdiction, but everyone knew who they were implicating. And the Army Pearl Harbor Board uh, reached the same conclusion. These are the closing words of their findings. Up to the morning of December the 7th, 1941, everything that the Japanese were planning to do was known to the United States. Now, the public reacted to the uh, accusation of dereliction of duty with hate mail and death threats. How do you think they reacted to the exoneration of Kimmel and Short? They didn't react because the President of the United States ordered that the results of the court's marshals be held top secret in the interest of national security. But after World War II, uh, a number of authors tried to bring the truth to the public's attention. Several books appeared. This is one of them, The Final Secret of Pearl Harbor, uh, subtitled The Washington Contribution by Rear Admiral Robert Theobald, was in Pearl Harbor commanding destroyers on the day of the attack. But books like this uh, didn't get much media attention. They didn't get big reviews in the New York Times. They didn't make it to the Book of the Month Club. They were out there for people who really wanted to know the truth, but they were hard to find. Big breakthrough came in 1982 when John Tolan, known as the Dean of World War II historians, wrote this book, uh, Infamy, Pearl Harbor and its Aftermath. At this point, uh, many more eyewitnesses had come forward to confirm the story and documentation was available that had not been available uh, in 1944. Now, following the publication of, of Tolan's book, the New American Magazine asked me to do a cover story summarizing the findings of Tolan and other authors about Pearl Harbor. And after that, the BBC did a documentary called Sacrifice of Pearl Harbor, which really re just, uh, restated what we said of the New America, and then that aired on the, on the History Channel. Now, some people might be wondering, well, you're talking about Washington's foreknowledge of the Pearl Harbor attack. Isn't that just a sensational claim? No, it's not. Washington knew through several means. One was the Purple Code, which was Japan's diplomatic code. This is the code they used to uh, communicate to their embassies and major consulates <laughs> throughout the world. It was so complex it had to be uh, enciphered and then deciphered by a machine. The Japanese were, were confident no one could break that code. But they were wrong. In 1940, some talented American uh, crypto analysts uh, broke that code and they devised their own machine. So in 1941, when our relations with Japan were, were quite tense, we're actually decoding the diplomatic messages usually within 24 hours of transmission. And every day, uh, those uh, uh, transcripts would be sent to the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Secretary of State, Army Chief of Staff, George Marshall, and a couple of other high officials. Now, what did the Purple Code reveal to Washington? Reveal that Japan had told <laughs> Berlin, the Germans, that war is about to break out. It revealed that Japanese spies in Honolulu were uh, ordered to tell Tokyo the exact locations of our ships and dock. Now, there's nothing unusual about spies watching ship movements, but when the enemy wants to know the exact location of each ship, it's obvious that they've been targeted for attack. Um, the code also revealed that the Japanese told their embassy and consulates in the United States to start burning all of their, their code books and their secret documents because, of course, once war broke out, uh, they were going to lose their diplomatic immunity. Now, in 1967, Hollywood produced a movie about Pearl Harbor called Tora, Tora, Tora. And uh, in that movie, they showed the Japanese ambassadors uh, presenting uh, the American Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, and that's the real Cordell Hull there. In the movie, they give him the declaration of war after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he reacts with absolute surprise. He's absolutely shocked that war has begun. In real life, Cordell Hull was not surprised. He'd already read that declaration of war the day before that in his office, the transcript of it, uh, 13 parts of the 14-part message as had President Roosevelt. But Washington also knew through personal warnings that it received. Um, Joseph Grew was our ambassador to Japan. In 1941, he told the president that he had heard from the Peruvian consulate in Japan that if our relations were to worsen, Japan planned to attack Pearl Harbor with all its strength. Also, J. Edgar Hoover warned the president about the Pearl Harbor attack. He based his information on um, info he'd gotten from a Yugoslavian double agent named Dusko Popov, who was working for both us and the Nazis, but his true loyalty was to us. He learned from the Germans that the Japanese were planning to attack Pearl Harbor. The uh, Japanese had, in fact, asked the Germans for advice on how to carry out that attack. And you can see Dusko Popov interviewed in that BBC documentary Sacrifice of Pearl Harbor. Another man you'll see uh, interviewed in that uh, at documentary is Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe, who was the U.S. military observer in Java, the island of Java, which was then under the control of the Dutch in the Pacific. 
The Dutch had also learned of the Pearl Harbor attack, and they warned Thorpe, who was so alarmed, he sent a total of four warnings to Washington about the forthcoming Pearl Harbor attack until finally General Marshall's office replied, send us no more warnings concerning Pearl Harbor. Colonel F.G.L. Weidemann was the Dutch military attaché in Washington at that time. He testified that he personally warned Army Chief of Staff George Marshall about the attack and sent it to Guy Gillette and Congressman Martin Dyes also received information concerning the attack. They had sat down with the president and he told them not to tell anyone else but just to leave it in his hands, the president's hands. Now, uh, 2001, uh, Disney made this movie, Pearl Harbor, starring Ben Affleck. Uh, it's a very standard rendering of the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, they show President Roosevelt completely shocked and surprised by the attack. And the producer of that movie, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, used four-letter words to describe anyone who would challenge that. Well, in response to that, the New American asked me to write another cover story on Pearl Harbor. And um, by now we had even more information, thanks uh, especially to Robert B. Stinnett. Um, in his book, Day of Deceit, The Truth About FDR and Pearl Harbor, he used the Freedom of Information Act to prove something we never knew before. We were not only decoding Japan's diplomatic messages, we were also decoding their naval messages as, as well. Now, it was commonly uh, misperceived that when the Japanese approached Pearl Harbor, that that task force maintained complete radio silence. Actually, they just observed discretion, but not complete silence. They were sending messages, and we were decoding those messages. And the most important was probably this, Admiral Yamamoto, the Japanese first air fleet, November the 26th, 1941, the task force, keeping its movement strictly secret and maintaining close guard against submarines and aircraft, shall advance into Hawaiian waters and upon the very opening of hostilities shall attack the main force of the United States fleet and deal it a mortal blow. The first air raid is planned for the dawn of X day, exact date to be given by later order. Now no one could read that message and not understand its meaning. I'd like to mention that following publication of our articles in the New American, uh, I was contacted by the attorney for the Kimmel family who uh, requested permission to use one of those articles. Uh, they've been uh, working for years to exonerate Admiral Kimmel's name and uh, I also was honored to receive a, a letter of thanks from uh, Colonel Walter C. Short, uh, U.S. Army retired, the son of the late Pearl Harbor commander. And I'd also like to mention that by resolution of the United States Congress, Kimmel and Short have been exonerated of any wrongdoing in any dereliction of duty. But in the meantime, how many people know this? You know, most people will say, you know, I didn't know there was any controversy about Pearl Harbor. I thought we just got attacked and that was it. Well, we'll see today, there's a lot of things the media just doesn't discuss. Let's get it back further to World War I. Now, uh, historians talk about a number of reasons why we got into World War I, but anybody know what the most inflammatory event was? That Lusitania, yeah. The Lusitania was a British passenger ship on its way from New York to Britain. It had a couple hundred Americans on board. At that time, Germany was at war with England, but we were not yet involved with the war, and the, the Germans torpedoed it. And Americans were told, you know, the Germans sank this, the, this ship just to kill innocent women and children. That is not the reason they sank the Lusitania. They sank it because it was loaded to the gills from one end to the other in its hold with munitions, shrapnel shells, millions of uh, rifle cartridges, gun, gun cotton. Uh, they were trying to stop these war supplies from reaching Britain just as the British were trying to do to Germany uh, with their own fleet. Now the ship went down in just 18 minutes after a single torpedo hit it and every survivor said there were two explosions. There was a small one and a big one. The small one of course was a torpedo and many think that the big explosion was the munitions detonating. Also very relevant was this. Winston Churchill was at that time the head of the British Admiralty, and prior to the sinking of Lusitania, he ordered a political study to be done to determine what the political impact would be if a British passenger ship was sunk by the Germans with Americans on board. And an exchange took place between the British Foreign Minister, uh, Lord Grey, and President Woodrow Wilson's top advisor, Edward Mandel House. Grey asked this question. What will America do if the Germans take an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House replied, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States, and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into the war. Commander Joseph Kenworthy, who was then in British naval intelligence, said, The Lusitania was deliberately sent at considerably reduced speed into an area where a U-boat was known to be waiting and with their escorts withdrawn. Now, in the United States, uh, an official hearing was held into the sinking of the Lusitania. 
And um, at that hearing, the officials were not allowed to see the original ship's manifest. They only were given a dummy manifest that omitted the ship's munitions. The original manifest was ordered by the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, to be hidden in the archives of the United States Treasury. If you'd like to know more about this, some good references are the book The Lusitania by Colin Simpson, British historian. Um, by the way, there's also a uh, documentary that aired on the History Channel, you can see it on YouTube, called In Search of the Lusitania, which we've used many of these facts. And also the book Room 40 by Patrick Beasley, who's considered the world's leading authority on the history of British naval intelligence. He was a former officer in that service. And here's what he writes in his book. I am reluctantly driven to the conclusion that there was a conspiracy to put the Lusitania at risk in the hopes that even an abortive attack on her would bring the United States into the war. Well, kicking it deeper into history one more time, how about the Spanish-American War? What was the event that brought us into that war? Sinking of the Maine. The Maine was a beautiful uh, new battleship, and uh, in 1898 it sailed at Havana Harbor, and three weeks later, massive explosion tore her apart. 266 crew members, as most of the crew, lost their lives. And soon thereafter, uh, you had headlines like this, especially in the Hearst newspapers, um, Spanish treachery, uh, Maine destroyed by outside attack, McKinley suspicious of Spanish plot, and Americans were treated to images like this. Um, we have Spain portrayed as half human, half ape. It's got a bloody hands on, on the um, uh, gravestone of the sailors of Maine. Look what it's doing. It's trampling the American flag, uh, just daring us to go to war. Well, I wrote an article in the Spanish American War just it was published just a couple of months ago in the uh, New American Magazine. I can tell you that the last thing Spain wanted was war with the United States. We had a steel navy. They had mostly a wooden navy. They knew they had no chance to win a war against us. The war with us was the last thing that Spain wanted. But there were some people who were interested in uh, this affair for the reasons of their own. National Citibank, which is the foreman of today's Citibank, loaned the U.S. government $200 million to uh, prosecute the war and then excise taxes were levied on the American people to repay National City Bank, which was also given control of Spain's sugar industry in Cuba. Cuba was actually the world's largest um, sugar producer in the 19th century. And we have a National City Bank ad um, about the glories of their, their new uh, sugar industry. <laughs> well, we started with Pearl Harbor in 1941. Let's start moving forward in history and start with the Korean War, which began in uh, 1950, June of 1950, when Kim Il-sung, the communist dictator of North Korea, ordered his communist troops to invade South Korea, the Free South. But here's a trivia question that very few people can answer. How did Kim Il-sung and the communists come to power in North Korea in the first place? And the answer is, we, the United States, our government officials, put them there in a roundabout way. And here's how it happened. During World War II, Joseph Stalin, dictator of the Soviet Union, was our ally against Germany. Uh, now, he was not a good guy to have as an ally. He killed millions of his own people. He was a totalitarian. Uh, but al although he was our ally against the Germans, he was not our ally against the Japanese. He had a uh, treaty with them, non-aggression pact. But at the big three conferences of Yalta and Tehran, President Roosevelt asked Stalin if he would break his non-aggression pact with Japan. He said, sure, I'll do that. But on this condition, I want the United States to supply my Far Eastern army with all the tanks, jeeps, planes, weapons, and munitions it'll need to prosecute this battle against Japan. And President Roosevelt agreed, and 600 shiploads of Lend-Lease were sent to Russia for the express purpose of fighting Japan. Now this has to go down as one of the worst decisions in American diplomatic history. Here come uh, Stalin's troops to fight the Japanese in China. Stalin waited until five days before the war ended. Uh, the uh, atom bomb has already pounded Hiroshima. There's no need to have the Russians come down in, into China to fight the Japanese. They didn't fire a shot. They were simply allowed to capture Japan's surrendered munitions. They then turned those and their American lend lease supplies over to Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communists for the overthrow of the Chinese government. But what about Korea? We're talking about Korea and the Korean War. Well, Korea up until now had been a colony of Japan. What do you do with it when the war is over? Well, as we're going to see today, America's most influential journal of foreign policy is called Foreign Affairs. And in 1944, Foreign Affairs published an article called Korea in the Post-War World. 
what they proposed was Korea should be divided into a trusteeship. Same deal that we gave to Germany, right? Germany is divided into east and west. The Russians got the east, and we and France and Britain took over with the west. Foreign Affairs proposed that the same thing be done for Korea. Uh, we'll take uh, control of the south, and uh, the north should go to our gallant communist allies, the Soviets. And this proposal was put to Stalin. Of course, he loved the idea. There he is with uh, Harry Truman at the Potsdam Conference. Now, um, uh, it's not uh, an exaggeration to say that the Russians were given North Korea as a reward for helping win the Pacific War, even though we won it, and they never fired a shot. Now, some people in response might say this, Mr. Perloff, don't get all paranoid here. Look, the guys who make our foreign policy are just good Joes like you and me. But you know, like all good Joes, sometimes they goof and make mistakes. Now, Mr. Perloff, do you make mistakes? You do? Oh, what a surprise. Well, sort of the guys who make our foreign policy. Hey, look, they blundered, that's all. That's a very simple explanation of what happened in Korea, which is that accidents do happen. Well, you know, uh, yeah, accidents do happen, not very often in politics, though. Um, before we uh, write this off as an accident, I want to point out that this little blunder cost over 50,000 GIs their lives in the Korean War and over one million Koreans who lost their lives in that war and created one of the worst dictatorships in world history. So before we dismiss it as a blunder, let's quote someone who didn't think it was a mistake. James Forrestal, who was Secretary of Defense under Truman, he saw that there was a clique in the State Department, you could call it the Dean Acheson clique, that was continually uh, making concessions to the Soviet Union and doing things that harmed USA and benefited Russia. And he said it can't be a chance that this is happening. Here's what he said. Consistency has never been a mark of stupidity. If the diplomats who have mishandled our relations with Russia were merely stupid, they would occasionally make a mistake in our favor. <laughs> and anybody know how Mr. Forrestal died? He fell from the 14th floor of a hospital. That's right. Uh, on uh, <laughs> May the 22nd, 1949, Secretary Forrestal fell to his death from the 16th floor of Bethesda Naval Hospital. But some people will explain that as, hey, accidents do happen. The guy probably slipped on a banana peel. Happens every day, Mr. Perloff. Well, if you want to do something interesting, uh, go ahead and Google the death of James Forrestal. But right now, let's move on to the, America's next war, which was the Vietnam War. What was the name of the resolution by which Congress authorized President Lyndon Baines Johnson to intervene in Vietnam with force. Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. That's right, and there it is, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which was based upon an alleged attack on U.S. destroyers on the night of August the 4th, 1964. Now, Admiral James Stockdale, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, was a pilot in the Tonkin Gulf at that time and on that night. And uh, he overflew the scene of the attack for 90 minutes, the alleged attack. Later he was shot down during the war, he spent seven hellish years in a communist POW camp. Finally came home and wrote his memoirs in Love and War, and he revealed what actually happened in Tonkin Gulf that night. And I'm going to pick it up from his return to the uh, aircraft carrier Ticonderoga. Quote, Wheeling into the ready room, I'd hurriedly left three hours before, I came face to face with about ten assorted ship's company, air group, and staff intelligence officers all with sheepish grins on their faces. The mood of the group was informal and mirth mirthful. Obviously, they had some big joke to tell me. What in the hell's been going on out there? They laughingly asked. Damned if I know, I said. Three a flap. The guy in the Maddox, that's one of the destroyers, air control radio was giving blow-by-blow -blow accounts. Turning left, turning right, torpedoes to the right of us, torpedoes to the left of us, boom, boom. They got right down there and shot whatever they were shooting at. It came around towards the destroyers once, right on the deck, chasing some imaginary PT boat they said was running up behind them. See any boats? Not a one. No boats, no boat wakes, no ricochets off boats, no boat gunfire, no torpedo wakes, nothing but Black Sea and American firepower. For goodness sakes, I must be going crazy. How could all that commotion have been built up out there without something being behind it? Now the next morning, uh, Stockdale was awoken by a young officer. Who are you, I asked. I'm the junior officer of the deck, sir. Captain sent me down to wake you. We just got a message from Washington telling us to prepare to launch strikes against the beach. What's the idea of the strikes? Reprisal, sir. Reprisal for what? For last night's attack on the destroyer, sir. I flipped on my bed lamp and the young officer left. It felt like I had been doused with ice water. We were about to launch a war under false pretenses. 
The fact that war was being conceived out here in the humid muck of the Tonga Gulf didn't bother me so much, but for the long pull it seemed important to me that the grounds for ending war be legitimate. I felt it was a bad portent. We seemed to be under the control of a mindless Washington bureaucracy vain enough to pick their own legitimacies regardless of evidence." Unquote. Admiral James Stockdale, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And by the way, it's eventually proven that the Tonkin Gulf Resolution was written before the Tonkin Gulf incident took place. Finally, the war in Iraq, and this is a pretty sensitive topic because it's so recent. I just want to mention that I have a lot of friends, I've sort of passed my church, I've had two nephews um, fighting in the Middle East. I know a lot of people there. It's a sensitive topic. I just want to say one thing about it, which is that um, uh, today we're told that the reason for the war in Iraq um, has been or was to bring freedom and democracy to the Iraqi people, Operation Iraqi Freedom. But that's not what we were told at all before that war began. We were told it was all about weapons of mass destruction. You'll recall that Colin Powell, Secretary of State, <coughs> went before the UN and said he had absolute proof of weapons of mass destruction which were threatening the world. Um, he said, my colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. We were giving you our facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. And President Bush, in a statement to the American people, said, Saddam Hussein and his weapons are a direct threat to this country, to our people, and to all free people. I will not leave the American people at the mercy of the Iraqi dictator and his weapons. But as many of you know, uh, David Kay, the chief U.S. weapons inspector, said that after long searching, no weapons of mass destruction could be found in Iraq. And he said, in his opinion, they had not existed there since the first Gulf War of 1991. And Colin Powell has since acknowledged what he said before the UN was based upon faulty intelligence. Now, if you take a look at these six wars, Spanish-American, World Wars I and II, Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq, you can make a pretty good case their involvement in each one of these wars was based on some sort of deception or false pretext, or to put it most charitably, a mistaken pretext. Now, is there another common denominator to these six wars? Yes, there is. I'm going to put it to you that the same organization of men was behind our involvement in each of these wars. Now, if I heard that, now some of you might say, uh, Mr. Perloff, uh, hey, uh, Looney Tune, uh, I got a news flash for you. Don't you think that the guys behind the Spanish-American War would be kind of like dead by now? So how could they be behind the war in Iraq? <laughs> well, we're talking about an organization that survives the generations. There's many like that, right? For example, uh, Marx and Engels released the Communist Manifesto in 1848, yet uh, more than 100 years later, long after they were dead, the Communists took power in China. There's millions of Republicans in America today, but the founders, who go back to the days of Abe Lincoln, are all dead now. The Christian Church goes back to, to uh, millennia. The Mafia, they say, goes back centuries. I'm talking about an organization like that. As the older members are dying off, younger members are coming in. So what organization am I talking about? Well, I'm going to use a polite term to describe it. A term that, you know, when I was a hippie back in 1970, and I, that's not me, but I used to hang out with guys who look just like that. It's very common for hippies to say, you know, it's really the establishment that runs this country. Um, and hippies like to characterize themselves as anti-establishment. What do they mean by that? They meant that there, there are these rich people who really call the shots in America. You know what, I do agree with hippies on that part. But here's where I disagree with them, okay? The way they characterized the establishment. They thought the establishment was conservative, anti-communist, patriotic, and mostly Christian. That was a lot like the John Birch Society and the Oath Keepers, only a lot richer in their view. Now, a pretty good uh, definition of the establishment was written by uh, Edith Kermit Roosevelt. She was a syndicated columnist, the granddaughter of Teddy Roosevelt. She wrote this. The word establishment is a general term for the power elite in international finance, business, and government who held most of the power regardless of who's in the White House. Most people are unaware of the existence of this legitimate mafia, yet the power of the establishment makes itself felt from the professor who seeks a foundation grant to the candidate for a cabinet post or State Department job. It affects the nation's policies in almost every area. Now, I'm going to underscore two things that uh, Roosevelt said there. International finance, because as, as we'll see today, these guys are tied to Wall Street. And regardless of who's in the White House, because to these guys, it doesn't matter whether the president is a Democrat or Republican. Now, some people would say this, Mr. Perloff, you obviously don't know anything about American government. And if you did, you know our government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. 
Uh, let's face it, Mr. Paul, if we the people hold the power, I mean, uh, the president uh, has to be elected by us. Same with the congressmen and, and, and senators, so obviously we're holding the power. I mean, uh, this is just uh, paranoid uh, lunacy, the idea that there's some sinister power behind the throne. We the people, we're the power behind the throne. And obviously, uh, you know, anything our government does, since we elect these guys, anything they do in foreign policy must be a reflection and extension of our own will. If we don't like the job they're doing, Mr. Perloff, there's a simple solution. We just vote the rascals out come the next election. Well, you know, um, I certainly agree that in principle, power is supposed to belong to the people, but I don't think that people are holding that much power today. Now, the establishment knows we have elections in this country, and uh, they've figured out ways to beat that. For one thing, they've figured out they can pretty much control who the two major party candidates will be in any presidential race. Uh, now, my focus is not elections tonight, but I don't want to leave that unsupported, so I'm going to take an example. Jimmy Carter was elected president in 1976. Trivia question. Seven months before the Democratic National Convention, what percentage of registered Democrats favored Jimmy Carter for president? Nine. It was actually less than 4%. Nobody even heard of this guy. So what happened? What happened was he was invited to dinner at Terrytown, New York, a state of... David Rockefeller, kingmaker of the establishment, and also at that meeting was the big new Brzezinski, who Carter later made his national uh, security advisor. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Carter's fortunes took off. I'm going to quote uh, conservative Senator Barry Goldwater of, of um, Arizona. He said this about that meeting. David Rockefeller and the big new Brzezinski found Jimmy Carter to be their ideal candidate. They helped him win the nomination of the presidency. To accomplish this purpose, they mobilized the power the Wall Street bankers and the media controllers. Now, let me flesh that in. By the time the nominating convention rolled around, Time Magazine had put Jimmy Carter on its cover three times, and their cover artists were told to make him look as much like John F. Kennedy as possible. Newsweek put him on their cover twice. The New York Times ran a series of uh, promotional articles puffing Jimmy Carter. The Wall Street Journal had an editorial saying that the best president for America among all the Democratic candidates would be Jimmy Carter. And the three networks back then, ABC, CBS, NBC, inundated the public with images of Jimmy Carter. So guess what? When the nominating convention rolled around, he got the nomination. But the question is, did he get it because independently Democrats each decided that Jimmy Carter was their man, or was it because he was picked in a high place and then packaged and sold to the public? With respect, I suggest it was the latter. And with respect, I suggest this has been done many, many times in the last century. But the establishment has another way of influencing the sitting president. One of them is the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR for short. It's the subject of my book, The Shadows of Power. Now, uh, we'll be talking about how the council influences the president. But first, um, let's answer this question. What is the actual goal of the Council on Foreign Relations? And to answer that, I'm going to quote a former member, Admiral Chester Ward, he was a member for 16 years before he resigned to discuss. He said, the main purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is promoting the disarmament of U.S. sovereignty and national independence and submergence into an all-powerful one-world government. These guys are into world government. I live up in Boston, and even the Boston Herald once had an editorial on these guys. And they said, the Council on Foreign Relations, those guys are foreign policy fuzzy thinkers who worship world government. Now in my, my book, I have uh, many quotes from the council itself, as well as its critics, validating that what they're after, what their game is, is world government. But we better define our terms. What, what, what would a world government be? It would be a single government ruling the entire globe. Now, we obviously don't have that today. I mean, Japan's government rules Japan, and Brazil's government rules uh, Brazil. So some people might think, well, Mr. Pullough, that would never happen in a million years. Well, actually, it's happening right now in Europe on a regional level with the European Union. You know, countries like England and Spain were once mighty empires. Now they're be becoming reduced to province status uh, progressively within the European Union. Each year, the national parliaments become more and more subservient to the European Parliament and the European uh, Commission in Brussels. As you know, they're consolidating their currencies into the euro. Uh, they're going to have a, uh, a uh, uh, European Pentagon over a European army. Uh, they're writing a European constitution. The EU has its own ambassadors. This is uh, world government on a regional scale, and it's a work in progress. And we'll see tonight, they envision the same thing for North America. 
Now, Foreign Affairs is the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, and um, I went through every issue before I wrote my book, and I found countless statements uh, promoting world government. You go back to the first year of publication, 1922, we read this. Obviously, there's going to be no peace or prosperity for mankind so long as it remains divided into 50 or 60 independent states. The real problem today is that of world government. Now, let me underscore something this writer said. I found that um, they love to use the phrase peace and prosperity to describe what world government would bring us. <laughs> the argument goes something like this. There's nothing worse than war, right? Now, the only reason we have wars because the world is divided into different countries. Now, if we just had a single government ruling the whole world, there could be no wars. We all live in peace and prosperity. Well, uh, refuting that is this man, uh, Professor uh, Rudolf Romo, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at University of Hawaii. He did a study of death in the 20th century. And we found, he found that in the 20th century, six times more people were killed by their own governments than were killed in wars. In other words, War is not the most legal thing. Government is. And if we had a world of government, the question is, who would run it? Now, the globalists are fond of saying, well, look, international coalitions are great, and international coalition defeated Saddam Hussein. Okay, but what happens if a Saddam Hussein becomes in charge of your world government? With one government, where can you run to hide? The founding fathers understood you never put all power in one place. You guys know this, but they didn't just give us an executive branch. They gave us a legislative branch. And within the leg legislative branch, it's check and balance between the House and Senate, plus your judicial branch. And while there has been corruption on all those branches, the division of powers has kept America from becoming a dictatorship. Incidentally, in their original vision, the uh, states were supposed to uh, keep the federal power in check as well. But that was, issue was more or less settled natively by the war between the states. James Madison, known as the father of the Constitution, said this, the accumulation of all power in the same hands may be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Therefore, a world government would be the worst tyranny imaginable. Now, the talk I'm giving tonight kind of naturally divides itself into three parts. We've just done part one, and we do part two, and then we'll take a break, and we'll do part three. All right, how about this Council on Foreign Relations? How did it get started? Well, it went back to the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, which was settling the aftermath of World War I. And President Woodrow Wilson, who we see on the right, went to that conference and always at his side was the man we see on our left, uh, Edward Mandel House. Uh, House was known as a front man for Wall Street. He was Wilson's controller. He lived right in the White House. Uh, he was called Assistant President House by Harper's Weekly. Uh, and his official biographer called him the Unseen Guardian Angel of the Federal Reserve Act. Now, let me be talking in this section about bankers and uh, finance, and it might seem like I pulled a switch on you, because you might think, well, Mr. Brother, you're talking about foreign policy and wars, and now you're talking about bankers. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is that the foreign policy establishment of the United States is inextricably linked to the banking establishment, and that shouldn't really surprise us that a plan for control and power would be linked to financial centers, right? Because what do we say? Uh, don't we typically say, humanly speaking, that money makes the world go round? And we want to know who's behind them. We say, follow the money, right? So let's follow the money, see who's behind the Council on Foreign Relations. Speaking of money, you should notice we have inflation in this country. We have rising prices, right? Let's take a trip down a memory lane. Uh, 1962, when I was a little boy, a candy bar cost a nickel. A postage stamp was four cents. A new pair of sneakers was five bucks. A movie ticket was 50 cents. Tuition at Harvard that year was $1,520. You could buy a new imported Renault automobile for $1,395. The average cost of a new house in America was $12,500. We've got uh, radically rising prices, and why is that? Well, if you consult the establishment media, they spin a number of yarns. They like to say things like, oh, it's all the American workers' fault. You know, some guy named Joe goes to his boss, he says, boss, my wife just had a baby. Uh, could I get a $50 a week raise? And the boss says, well, Joe, I'd like to give you a raise. The only way I can afford to do that is by passing on the cost to the people we do business with. I'll have to raise their prices by $50 a week. So the people doing uh, business with Joe's company say, well, if you guys are raising your price to $50 a week, we'll have to raise our price to $50 a week. And all across America, prices go up because greedy Joe and other workers like him 
ask for a raise. Um, and we're, we're told that inflation is inevitable. It's like death and taxes. You'll always have it. And it does look that way. If you look at the consumer price index, they were responsible for the deaths of thousands of young Americans. Now, Kevin Short protested the findings of the Roberts Commission. They pointed out that Justice Roberts had taken unsworn testimony until they corrected that. Uh, they, he'd refused them the right to have uh, fellow officers serve as their attorneys. He said, this is not a trial, so you don't have, have to have an attorney. And they found that significant testimony was left out of the report. So these two guys did something almost no military man ever asked they, to be done. They asked to be court-martialed because they wanted the issue of Pearl Harbor to be resolved in a real courtroom using standardized rules of evidence, not uh, Owen Roberts' personal rules. But President Roosevelt said no. He said, look, I've already relieved these men of their duties. We're at war now. There's more important things. No court, courts martial. Uh, no, no, that, that won't do any good. But Kimmel and Short kept pressing their case, and so did Congress. They wanted these trials, too. Finally, in 1944, Congress mandated that the courts martials occur, and in that year, the Naval Court of Inquiry and the Army Pearl Harbor Board convened. Now, at these two trials, the attorneys for Kimmel and Short presented undeniable evidence that Washington had complete foreknowledge of the Pearl Harbor attack, but withheld it from our... Let's see, uh, I don't know if we want to experiment with turning off the front lights, Kip, on that. Uh, I guess we have a pretty clear image with the light, with the, uh, lights on. Okay. Well, we'll be talking... Uh, it's even better, though. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, American history tonight in a way that... Uh, some of you may never have heard it told before. Just ask that you listen with an open mind. I'm going to start with um, one of the most tragic events in American history, Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Uh, 18 U.S. warships, including eight battleships, were sunk or heavily damaged. About 2,000 Americans were killed, many more wounded. About 200 planes destroyed on the ground. And uh, what question do you think Americans were asking the day after Pearl Harbor? Besides what happens now, what do you think people were asking? Where is Pearl Harbor? <laughs> well, now they're probably asking that in our school system. But um, uh, they were asking, you know, how did this happen? How come America got caught off guard like this? How could this disaster have taken place? Well, President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, appointed a commission to um, answer that question. It's called the Roberts Commission. And the Roberts Commission might be called a Washington-friendly group. Uh, the mayor ran it. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Owen Roberts was quite friendly with the president. Retired Admiral Joseph Rees had been given a job in lend lease by the president. Uh, General McNarney was uh, on the staff of uh, Army Chief of Staff George Marshall and uh, selected <laughs> on his recommendation. Um, General McCoy was uh, a personal friend of Army Chief of Staff Marshall. It was a very Washington friendly group. Well, they held three weeks of hearings. They had. Uh, a couple of days they spent in Washington, then 19 days in Hawaii. And at the end, they issued an official report, and they said that Washington had uh, done its job in an exemplary manner before Pearl Harbor. They said all the blame lay with our military commanders in Hawaii, namely Admiral Husband Kimmel, the Pacific Fleet Commander, and General Walter C. Short, the Army Commander. They said they uh, failed to take adequate surveillance of the waters surrounding the islands, and they accused them of dereliction of duty. And the words dereliction of duty appeared on newspaper headlines across America. These two guys were crunched. I mean, they got inundated with hate mail and death threats. Even members of Congress stood up and said these two men should be shot because... They uh, James Perloff is a freelance writer based in Boston, Massachusetts. For many years, he has been a contributor to the New American Magazine. His first book, Shadows in a, of Power, an expose of private influence on American foreign policy, has sold over 100,000 copies. His most recent books, Tornado in a Junkyard and The Case Against Darwin, are layman's level discussions of the growing scientific case against Darwin's theory of evolution. Mr. Perloff has been a guest on well over 100 radio and television programs to discuss both history and the creation evolution debate. He's noted in Who's Who in America. He is also a, a composer of the music CD, Freedom Shall Return. Jim will be happy to sign any copy of his books after the speech. I also want to say I've been a member of the Birch Society for eight years. I've been on staff six. I've worked with Jim many times. He's a, he's a wonderful speaker, a great gentleman, and a true friend. Thank you. Thank you. Our military commanders. 
Now, as the um, admirals on the Naval Court of Inquiry heard the evidence being read, they threw their pencils on the floor in disgust, and uh, Admiral Kimmel was completely exonerated. They laid all blame on Washington. They couldn't name Roosevelt because it was beyond their jurisdiction, but everyone knew who they were implicating. And the Army Pearl Harbor Board uh, reached the same conclusion. These are the closing words of their findings. Up to the morning of December the 7th, 1941, everything that the Japanese were planning to do was known to the United States. Now, the public reacted to the uh, accusation of dereliction of duty with hate mail and death threats. How do you think they reacted to the exoneration of Kimmel and Short? They didn't react because the President of the United States ordered that the results of the court's marshals be held top secret in the interest of national security. But after World War II, uh, a number of authors tried to bring the truth to the public's attention. Several books appeared. This is one of them, The Final Secret of Pearl Harbor, uh, subtitled The Washington Contribution by Rear Admiral Robert Theobald, who was in Pearl Harbor commanding destroyers on the day of the attack. But books like this uh, didn't get much media attention. They didn't get big reviews.